Are, are you now ready, John? <laughs> yep. Okay. The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab episode 809 for Monday, April 6th, 2020. Good readings, folks, and Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We mix them all together. We add in our own questions, our own tips, our own cool stuff found. The goal is we mix it together into an agenda that allows every single one of us, you, me, him, to each learn at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include PDF Pen 11 at smilesoftware.com slash podcast, Mint Mobile at mintmobile.com slash MGG, and MailRoot at mailroot.net slash MGG. We will talk more about those in a little while. But for now, here, right here, still here in durham new hampshire i'm dave hamilton and here in fairfield connecticut this is john f braun how are you doing today mr john f braun good and i'm testing my camera gamut here by um uh wearing a hawaiian shirt if you're watching the video if you're listening you're probably not going to see the shirt unless you have superpowers or something that's true that's true. Yeah, we are recording video, as we mentioned last week, and it will be, it's live streamed right at the same time that we live stream at uh, the, the show every week, which you can join the calendar at com slash calendar if you want to do that. Uh, and then also it'll be published to our Facebook and YouTube pages as well if you want to watch it after the fact. And we put the YouTube video in the in the article as well. So, that, you know, at MacObserver.com you can see it. I want to take a quick minute, though, um, we had an issue last week where we fell off the iTunes or Apple Podcasts store. No one knows why, not even the people at Apple Podcasts. But when we came back up, it looked like we had lost like a year of our reviews. Uh, it turns out that most, if not all of them, came back. But I posted on Twitter and I said, oh, folks, would you please just, you know, go add some reviews out there? And so many of you did. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, if you haven't, of course, you can go to MacGeekUp.com slash reviews and go leave us a five-star review. But of some of the uh, five-star reviews that we got, Stooms says, long-time listener, been listening almost since the beginning. You can't do better than to spend your time with these two. Thank you. Walker, New York Ranger, writes, excellent. Started listening way back in 2012 when I got my first Mac so I could learn what's what, and I've listened every week since. Uh, Grover Scorner writes, best Mac podcast hands down. Well, thank you, Grover. That's awesome. Dave and John are an amazing duel, uh, providing welcome technical advice to listeners' questions, new found OS X and iOS hints, reviews of new Apple and third-party products, and generally anything that an Apple enthusiast wouldn't want to miss. This is my go-to podcast every week. And uh, there's many, many more. You can see them, of course, if you go to MacGeekUp.com slash reviews. Thank you so much. We'll read some more next week. I just don't want to spend the whole episode reading because we've got stuff to do. In fact, we're going to start with some cool stuff found. That worked for you, John? Absolutely. Sweet. Uh, all right. So Tom uh, starts us off. Tom makes a cool stuff found and tells us that it's back. He says, you've been kind enough to mention Flame, my Bonjour browser, on the show a few times. I thought you might like to know that thanks to the changes in the latest version of Xcode and Catalina, I've been able to update the iOS version of Flame to also run on the Mac. I also added dark mode and multi-window support to the iPad app and made it generally much nicer on large screens, if that's your thing. The Mac version requires a very recent version of Catalina, but that's the trade-off I had to make. I would never have had time to support it otherwise. Uh, and the last version of Flame for Mac is a 32-bit app and was last released when Mac OS 10.3 was a thing. So we will put links to all of this, of course, in the show notes at MacGeekUp.com because that's what we do. But uh, that flame has been a, a thing that we've loved for years, huh, John? Uh, it's always interesting, especially when you're in a, 
uh, foreign or public network mm. to run something like that and see all the people there. I do that every now and then. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, I was looking another tool that I like, which uh, takes a different angle, but um, Thing is also another very good one to see what's on your network. So that's more an IP based. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Rather than Bonjour. Um, the only thing that made me sad is I was searching and apparently they only have a command line version still on the Mac, but maybe we'll see a desktop version of Thing because I, I find it very useful. I would, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, is there a browser version? I don't know how much you can do with the browser version of Thing. So, hmm. Oh, I didn't know that, like a browser plugin or something? Okay, I'll have to, have to check it out. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. So, um, well, just a web interface. I thought there was a thing. There is a thing web interface. I'm not sure if it's as full featured as what you can get on iOS, though. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Let's go to Bob. And Bob tells us, he says, uh, you guys, mostly Dave, keep bringing up how great clipboard managers are. He says, I never bothered to try one. A year or so ago, he says, I got the free copy clip. It was okay, and I used it, but it wasn't always convenient. Not long ago, Better Touch Tool added a clipboard manager. You can bind a trackpad gesture, a keyboard shortcut, a mouse button, or magic mouse gesture to trigger the Better Touch Tool clipboard manager's interface. I created a magic trackpad four-finger swipe down to bring up the Better Touch Tool clipboard manager, and since I'm already on the magic trackpad, I just move the cursor to the entry I want and double tap to paste it. I've also added some keyboard shortcuts to select and paste older entries. So he's got command, option, control, one, two, three, and four for the latest and then four most recent entries. I like this idea. If you remember the order that you copied things, now you can just paste them out without even having to bring up the interface. That's pretty good. Uh, he says, I stopped there as chances are I would barely remember the fourth, let alone the fifth or the sixth. Very, very cool. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing this with us, Bob. And we'll put a link to Better Touch Tool in the show notes, of course, because that's... Um, that's what we do. Very cool. Thanks, man. Are you yet using a clipboard manager, Mr. John F. Brown? No, though I did download this because apparently they have a way where you can customize the uh, touch bar. So um, I'm still... Oh, right. That. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. You're a so are you finding yourself using the touch bar much, John? Oh, absolutely. Like for logging in, using Touch ID, I think that's very handy. And so Touch ID... Purchasing. Yeah, I'm curious. I, I, I should have clarified my question um, because I have the MacBook Air, which has the Touch ID sensor, but but not the full touch bar. So I'm curious if you're using the touch bar portion versus just the Touch ID sensor, because I agree the Touch ID sensor is yes. life changing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. For setting volume, for setting brightness, uh, I find okay. it useful. Um, and it's also cool if you buy something and they support um apple pay through the browser um when it, it it's time to purchase it'll come up in big red letters saying uh, press here to pay 100 whatever dollars cool and then you touch id and then you bought it just like on on my iphone so uh yeah some some people diss it but um sure i don't know i i find a, a lot of times what, what they show isn't you know of interest but uh, right right every now and then i find something nice that's good that's good. Cool. Yeah. I'm. I when I tested that MacBook Pro last year, it, it had the Touch Bar, the the re, revamped 13 inch low end, you know, quad core MacBook Pro. Uh, it had the Touch Bar, and it was like, eh, yeah, this is cool. I mean, it it is cool how you drag things down to it and all of that stuff. But um, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It, it didn't it didn't get right into my workflow. So, um, speaking of which, I don't have a whole lot to say yet. Because I just got it set up uh, the other day, but uh, I do have one of the new MacBook Airs, the 2020 MacBook Airs that uh, I have on loan from Apple that I'm testing. And so we'll we'll catch up on that. But I, I will say, I will not bury the lead here, that keyboard, it's a nice change. So I think that's good. All right. Uh, Let's keep on keep on moving with our cool stuff found here, John. And let's go to Russell. Russell says, uh, I was looking for a way to use AirPlay to play an Apple Music subscription to my stereo. As I was struggling to install 
uh, an app on my Raspberry Pi called SharePort Sync. Searching through the comments to find solutions, someone mentioned a, a Raspberry Pi app called Volumio, V-O-L-U-M-I-O. 30 minutes later, including download time, hunting for an SD card, and updating Etcher, I had a Raspberry Pi plugged into my stereo streaming music from my Mac over AirPlay. The Volumio package makes the Pi into an appliance. There's no need to dink around with Raspbian or anything like that. He says it's basically like any other IoT device. It creates its own Wi-Fi network that you point to with a web browser. You configure it, and then you attach it to your network. He says, uh, what I plan to use it for is barely an afterthought compared to all of Volumio's other functionality. You can point your web browser to it for a really full-featured music player. Uh, you can use it to store and play your music collection. It has a web radio feature and more and more. He says it's all open source and doesn't seem to have a way to pay for it. At the end of the manual, they suggest you buy their iOS app for $2 to provide a little support. Uh, I did, but I have no intention of using the iOS app. He said, but I bought it for support anyway. Looks like they have a subscription for additional premium services and I may, uh, and, and may sell some pre-configured appliances to use their software. So we'll link to Volumio, but that's outstanding. That's the, that's what should exist. Like some way of, you know, a sub $50 solution to add airplay to an otherwise dumb speaker, Right. That's what we need, and Apple doesn't sell that right now. I mean, I know they sell their HomePod, but that's if you've already got your setup and you just want to add AirPlay to it, uh, this is, you know, and if it's as easy as he says, and I, I trust him, Russell's written it a few times before, uh, then there you go. Super easy. Pretty cool, huh, John? Yeah. Are they still selling the Airport Express? Because that's what I use for one of my AirPlays. I don't think so, John. I don't I don't think I'm so. I'm sure you can still find them used, but Yes. Yeah. That's right. And the Airport but Express works for you? Costs, but this probably costs more a little bit more than an airport. So But the Airport Express was like under under hundred bucks, I think, when I bought right. it. Right. Or hundred right. bucks. No, this would cost less than an express. I mean, you can get a Raspberry Pi, I think, for like fifty bucks or maybe even a little less. So and then and then the yeah, app's free. Just offer that as a solution if you can get a good deal on an airport express that's mm. uh Oh, no, I agree. Your audio. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Uh, we talked last episode about using different, uh, using the Eufy cam as an RTSP uh, camera for your uh, surveillance station on your Synology. Well, Ralph writes in and says that real link cameras work fine with surveillance station too. He says, great quality cameras. Uh, they're sold by Amazon. He says, I have five connected and up and running uh, I, I took a look at them. I have not used them myself, but the reviews and, and everything about these seems pretty good. So if you're looking for cameras for surveillance station, uh, real link is also available. So the link for that is also in the show notes, right? Good, John. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. And one last cool stuff found, uh, for me, I've been, you know, I, I mess around with all kinds of different mesh Wi-Fi stuff because it's what I do. And I have some Wi-Fi six mesh stuff here. So that's coming, but the, um, it, this is not Wi-Fi six, but the unify, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the unify stuff cause it's super, it's like easy, but also geeky and you can tweak it and it's high quality and goes far and fast and all of that good stuff. And they're new, uh, relatively new Beacon HD mesh point plugs right into an outlet four by four dual band Moomimo, all of that stuff. It's, you know, 802.11 AC wave two. So it has all of that super fast links up with the network and it's a nice $129 way to add yet another mesh point to your unify setup. Um, and it, it I like it it does take up two outlets when you plug it into a, a wall outlet but it it sits flush against the wall it's pretty cool um so it you know worth it's worth checking out uh, there you go I like it that's good we've, we've got it downstairs in our house and it really does kind of help to smooth out coverage in those those harder to reach areas um, obviously all Wi-Fi connected all that good stuff so good any thoughts on that John before we uh before we move on? Uh-oh. No. Okay. 
There he is. I was shaking my head no. Now that we have video. No, you have to talk. Visual cues. Yeah, visual cues are good. It's good for us to see each other, but but the <laughs> listeners still need to uh, still need to hear us. So, all right. Uh, if it's all, I would like actually very much to talk about our first sponsor, if that works for you, Mr. Braun. Okay. All right. Look. When you want the very best in email security, spam protection, virus protection, phishing protection, malware protection, and downtime protection, you do what we've just recently done. You go with MailRoot, who is our next sponsor here, because MailRoot focuses on just this. Anybody that's listened to this show for any length of time has heard me say one of the best technical business decisions I ever made was to stop running my own mail servers. And that's because running a mail server, and especially running the filtering portion, which requires you to stay right on top of it, is a full-time job. Good news. It's MailRoot's full-time job, right? They know what they're doing. They've been doing this for seven years, but their founder, Tom, I mean, he, he goes all the way back to the beginning of ARPANET 1 in a UCLA science lab. This guy knows how to build distributed networks and deal with spam and all of those things beyond that. And so he started a company to do this, not just for himself, but for all of us. And it's fantastic. As email comes in, it goes through all of their filters. But the best part is you get to know what's happening. It's not some black box. If it chooses to block something, you can see that it chose to block it. You can even get you know, a digested notification once a day. You can get it 12 times a day if you want, telling you what it has blocked. And if there's something that it has blocked incorrectly, you can undo it. Try that anywhere else. Good luck, right? There's a difference between I've classified this as spam and I've completely blocked this from going to any of your boxes. MailRoot does both and lets you control both. More than that, MailRoot has downtime protection. Yeah, it shows you 30 days of clean mail in their web interface. So if something happens to your mail server, you can still go in their web interface and see the email that's come in. And that's a very important thing. So they're protecting you against all this stuff and downtime. You've got to check it out. Go to mailroot.net slash MGG. This is where you want to go to get started. You get your free 30-day trial. No credit card required. Mailroot.net slash MGG. And our thanks to Mailroot for doing what they do for us and for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you want to take us to JP? I'm going to take it to JP. So okay. JP says, um, or you sent a screenshot, and it was the uh, iPad OS 13.4 update, and he noticed one of the items in files is iCloud Drive folder sharing from the Files app. Controls to limit access to people you explicitly invite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think this means it's available on Mac OS as well? And you know what? I remember seeing something, I believe, in the 10.15.4 update that did mention that as well. Um, that's the good news. Uh, here's the bad news. Uh, it's not entirely obvious how you do this. <laughs> so if you want to do this, um, there's a nice support article called Use iCloud File Sharing to Share Folders and Documents with Other iCloud Users. And Dave and I even tried it out. So Dave was being nice and decided to share with me. And, uh, you know, I got an invite, and th then we have a folder that we can both go to. And actually, uh, you know, when you drag something in there, um, usually it indicates uh, the owner. Or in my case, if I look at a file that I dragged in there, it'll say me. It's like, who, who shared this? Me. Right. And then a couple other files from you said shared, Dave Hamilton. So, um Check that article out. Uh, if you have the space and you want to share stuff with people and they're also on iCloud, then uh, um, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's, su it's super easy. It, it, it really did just work as well as, as John described and put things in. It, w one cool part we noticed it, when I, I created this, I share, I sync my documents and desktop with iCloud, right? I have that little checkbox turned on. Uh, when I created the folder to share with John, it was a folder in my documents folder. 
which is not in my, you know, iCloud Drive folder on my Mac. Didn't matter. It it shared it with John. It for you, I think John, it put it in your iCloud Drive folder by default, right? Yes. And then you were able to move that to your documents folder and all the syncing followed along. It just has to be, as we found thus far, it has to be somewhere that is synced by iCloud. Though I wonder, like, could I take this and put it somewhere that's not synced by iCloud? And would that still work? I mean, maybe? Let's see. I think I, I tried that. If I put this in my... Oh, if I move it to my downloads folder, which is not shared or synced with iCloud, it says moving it will stop sharing on iCloud. Okay, so it's smart enough to uh, to pick that up. That's good. That's great. Sweet. Sweet. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, good on that one. Anything more to add? It's there. Yes. It's there on my on my iPhones and all that too. It really, it works great. Thanks for asking about it, JP. I don't. I don't know, you know, we've we've already got so many folder sharing solutions. I don't know that I would have how long it would have taken me to try that had had you not asked about it. So, it was good. And it's it's super easy. You just share. You know, we did it with or I did it with the um I created a folder, highlighted it and then used the share icon in the toolbar of the Finder. I'm not sure, could I right-click on it and choose share? Yes, you can right-click on it or control-click on it and choose share, add people. That's the key there, is share, add people. So uh, just, remember, just remember that. So, All right, uh, moving on to Doug. Doug brings us a question. Basically, he says, I have AT&T's one gigabyte, one gigabit fiber internet. They offer... Uh, a mesh box for 49 bucks that adds mesh capabilities to their router. What do you think of it? The advantage for me, he says, is that it works with my existing router and gateway. So a more generic question, should I use my ISP's mesh offering? And if you're already using a router from your ISP and you are basically happy with its routing capabilities, but you need some additional meshing, it's worth trying. I mean, the your your cost delta to just add one mesh point from your ISP is relatively low compared to what you might pay for, um, you, you know, a full mesh setup, of course, right? Because you're not buying all the extra stuff. You're just buying the one mesh point that you need. And, of course, support if you're using your ISP's stuff. You're already going to rely on them for some level of support just because that's how it works. And so adding that, I, I think it's worth trying. I mean, you know, for he said it was 49 bucks when I looked on the web. It said it was 39. So that that's even better. Um, no reason you shouldn't try it. My guess, most ISPs are usually pretty good about return policies, too. So uh, check it. But my guess is that if you get this and it doesn't work, you get all your money back anyway. Uh, so I, I would I for 40 bucks. Yeah, go. Sure. What do you think, Mr. Braun? Why not? Why not? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. What's the yeah. worst that could happen? Yeah, the worst is that it just doesn't do what you need. Yeah, and then and then you go, you know, you move on. Yeah, cool. All right. Kevin. Uh, Kevin. Yeah, take us to Kevin, please. All right, Kevin is a good one. Uh, for several years, the shared storage on my home network has been a pair of mirrored disks hanging off a spare Mac Mini. Those disks are five plus years old and almost full, so it's time to upgrade. I just bought a Synology DS1019 Plus, I think I have one of those too, and a stack of Iron Wolf drives to do the trick. We have three Macs in the house, and I plan to redirect their Time Machine backups to the new Synology. I recall a previous episode where you mentioned a trick to keep Time Machine backups from eventually using up all the space in the Synology, but I can't seem to find it. I found it. Um, does that involve disk quotas, separate shares? I'd like to limit the amount of Synology storage dedicated to Time Machine so I don't get caught. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, you pre you pretty much covered the the, the major steps here. Um, so you create a shared folder to hold the time machine content. Um, I don't think you have to, but it just makes it easier to track things. Um, defining a user or users. So so in my case, I actually define two users. So I have one user called Time Machine MacBook Pro and another called Time Machine Mac Mini. Um, and then as you suspected, yes. And then for each of those users. 
you set the quota because you probably, um, and I don't know, a rough guide here is I usually set the quota to be twice the size of the hard drive that I'm backing up from. It's so, fair. Um, yeah. yeah, but um, check it out. Um, it's called How to Backup Files from Mac to Synology NAS with Time Machine, and it goes into a bit more detail and actually has screenshots and all that showing you all the steps you need to go through. But yeah, I mean, it's an excellent way to deploy time machine and, and it does it pretty well it you know i mean you got to bounce around to three different uh, three major steps but okay um, yeah. but it's worked great for me yeah i yeah i i i've done i've done that for my time machine and i i create yeah i, I do the exact same thing that you do i create a separate user for each computer and then that way you can quote it and, and it yeah works yeah yeah, the only yeah. weird thing, now let me know if this happens here. It's funny because on one of my machines, it actually shows the quota sizes when, when I bring up the time machine. So on the mini here, yeah. So right now it says 563 gigs of two terabytes available. The only weird thing is that on my other machine, Dave, the MacBook Pro, even though I have the same quota defined, it shows these ridiculous sizes that are way larger. So I don't know if the file is corrupt or if I should recreate it. I've restored hmm. from it and everything seems to be still there. So I huh. just thought I'd mention that because it's it's something one weird thing that I observe. So if that happens to you, I Wait, don't so think say, it's, it's a big deal. Say that again. Your time machine file is bigger than your drive? Uh, when I go to time machine control panel, uh, uh, system preference, it shows X of Y available those numbers being, you know, yeah. how much is used and how much is available. The, the thing is, those numbers don't match the quota I defined, and I don't know why. Oh, that's weird. Huh. Huh. It should. But if I look at the file on the Synology itself, the, the size is, you know, something reasonable. It, it's just not displaying it. So I don't know if it's a bug in Time Machine or... Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, yeah. a great solution. Cool. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to uh, I'll have to dig into that. I don't know, huh? All right. Yeah, I'll send you a screenshot so you can mark. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll 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 dig in. That's what we do. Uh, all right. We a few episodes ago, we asked for your thoughts on how to track the shows that you are watching, so that we don't forget what shows we're watching, and and that. Like that's actually mattered more now than ever. We 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 changed this at home when we first talked about it, and once we get through all this, I'll explain the solution that we chose. Uh, but because uh, we've got a bunch of your comments here, but then our daughter came home from school because you know school is is closed and it's all remote, and now like our TV watching habits have changed because we've got all four of us in the house all the time it's just how it is so it's even more important now so uh we'll go through some of your comments here and share various solutions there near as i can tell there is no best one but uh you might find one that works for you and that's that's sort of the point so we will start with rob and rob says uh coming at this issue uh, from one angle, there's a, a piece of software called Channels DVR at GetChannels.com. Uh, he says, I haven't had a chance to fully set it up because I'm still playing around with the Plex DVR, but it is my understanding that Channels is unique in that it aggregates all of your subscriptions with the right hardware to schedule and capture not only over-the-air broadcasts and cable TV using tuners from someone like Silicon Dust, but also streaming services as well. It seems to have promise as potentially the holy grail of DVR if you're willing to get your hands a little dirty and tinker with a solution that you build yourself. All right, cool. Well, we will put a link to that in the show notes. I haven't I haven't dug into that one, but that sounds actually sounds very interesting. It's like you said, a little bit of a, a broader, longer term solution. So that's pretty good. Uh, John, you picked up one from uh, from Jamie. Actually, you picked up a couple. You want to tell us about Jamie's? Uh, oh, wait, no, it's not Jamie. Yeah. It's Zhang. Why did I put Jamie? No, I'm looking at the signature. Oh. All right. <laughs> so, sorry about that, Zhang. And, uh, sorry about that, Jamie. Um, 
Hi, Dave and John. A great way to keep track of shows is sonar with two R's. While designed primarily to facilitate the download of television by whatever legal or non-legal means you choose, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> it is fantastic for keeping track of television shows and can be used just for the sake of keeping track. All you do is add a show you're currently watching and it'll connect to the tvdb.com and it will subscribe you to data about that show, display you all the episodes in that series, description, show posters, as well as list future episodes. It can show you all of this via calendar views of daily, weekly, or monthly. It can even give you a constantly updated ICS file. So it's right there on your Mac or iOS calendar. Even better, it has great integration with Kodi, MB, Plex, Tracked, Growl, Push Bullets, Synology Indexer. Wow. I don't even know about half of those. <laughs> Um, and so many other handy ways of letting you know you have a show to watch. It's multi-platform, so for those who may not want it on their Mac, it can be installed on a Raspberry Pi somewhere in the corner of your network and be on 24-7. And you can find it at https colon slash slash sonar with two R's dot TV. Thank you. So have, did you have you messed with sonar at all, John? Uh, no. Oh, okay. So I, I've used radar before a little bit, which is the essentially the same thing, but for movies. Um, it, it was a little more complex than I needed, so I sort of left it behind. But I, I had messed with radar and sonar on my disk station because you can install them. I, I, they're part of the Sino community uh, group of packages uh, that are available for, for Synology. So that if, if you haven't added the Sino community stuff, we'll put a link in there. If you're a Synology person, it just makes life a lot easier, but there is a sonar package and, um, and it's built to do exactly all the things that Zhang pointed out for us. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it, it's a fascinating world that holds sonar, radar, Cody world is there's a lot to it. So yeah, cool. You want to tell us right. uh, about James? Got a quick one from James. I've used ITV shows for years. It's not ever on the bleeding edge of technology or UI paradigms, but it's done precisely what I need it to do for over six years. So I'm going to link to that. Thank you, James. Cool. Cool, cool. Uh, how about, uh, so we've got, we've got Sonar, we've got Channels DVR, we've got ITV shows. Uh, Dan... Dan, rec Dan recommended one that I think a lot of, I know a lot of you recommended. Why don't you read uh, Dan's uh, opinions about uh, this next one? Yeah. So uh, Dan says, I have been using the website tracked.tv for many years. I've been paying VIP also, but I don't find their ads too intrusive when I have let my membership lapse. They've been promising a mobile app since they've started, but they haven't delivered. I suppose it's more difficult than they imagined. There are third-party apps that will feed off their information and your account, but I haven't cared for any of them. I prefer simply using their website, and I mostly stay in the calendar where you can see what shows are coming up and check them off as you watch them. There are settings that fade or hide what you watched also, and if there's a show that I wonder when it's coming back, you can search for it and see each season and each episode and the dates. I'm not sure that it has everything, but I use it for TV, Hulu, movies, and I see CBS Live Access and Netflix shows. The developers are very responsive. For years, I had trouble with the previous month arrow on the website calendar. One day, I emailed them that it seemed to be too close to the edge for my phone. It was fixed in a day, and I felt pretty stupid for waiting so long to ask them. Just thought I'd share. Can't wait to hear if there's anything better out there, but I'm mostly happy with Tracked. Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, and you're on a roll, man. Why don't you read Ben's? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let me find Ben. Where are you, Ben? You got it? There he is. Okay. Yeah, he's right about Dan. Okay. Cool. Easy recommendation from Ben. Television time. I've been using it for a couple of years now, and it makes my life really simple. I can easily find shows I want to track and add them to my list, indicate the episodes I've watched, and see when new episodes are upcoming. I can also discover popular, trending, and anticipated shows as well as track my consumption. Television time uses the database maintained by ooh, tracked.tv. By the way, if you're looking for a similar search and tracking of movies, I like to do movies. Cool. All right. And to do movies. All right. Well, we'll put the we'll put all of it in the show notes. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, John, for reading all those. That's great. And one last one from Greg on this 
uh, he says, check out the iOS app Just Watch uh, for TV tracking as well. So we'll put all of this in the show notes. I've experimented with a few of these, and we did make a change to how we're tracking things here. And believe it or not, we're using Apple TV. The TV app uh, works really well if you add stuff into it. We even have added in the shows that we would normally watch via TiVo just because it's really nice to see in one place where those episodes have come in. We can watch them in the Apple TV app because for the most part that links with all of the various networks and, and services that uh, we that TiVo would record from. Uh, it's a little nicer usually to watch anything TiVo has recorded from TiVo because shifting around and it is, I mean, it's local data, right? So it's way, there's no lag of the streaming or anything like that. So we tend to watch in TiVo, but then we can just tell it, oh, we've watched this episode in Apple TV and that part's manual, but eh, you know, it's fine. The only thing for us that Apple TV won't track, of course, is our Netflix habits, but that's okay. Netflix tracks them. So we basically have two apps that we use and it's been working out fine. And we didn't have to, you know, build a database of our own or, or um, use a spreadsheet or anything like that. So it, it has been working. It's not perfect, though. So I, I still have it on my list to try out some of these that, that we just mentioned. John, have you, what do you use and have you made any changes to your uh, viewing habits or anything like that? Um, I mostly use the TiVo. Sometimes I will... Um... Uh, Apple TV I also use yep. for a couple of a couple of things. So uh so in the TiVo I have Netflix and I have Plex running on that. Okay. And then also, you know, record off a cable and then the Apple TV I'll use that sometimes to run Plex. Or the, I like the client on the Apple TV better than on TiVo. Um but in the Apple TV I'll run Netflix I may run Netflix or uh Plex or the other one is that um, one of the better stations I've found in that if I miss a show for whatever reason, if the cable goes out or the scheduling gets confused, uh, the CW seems to make almost all of their stuff available going way, way back. Um, what I found is sometimes you can stream the most recent episode via the web, but they typically don't offer it way, way back. So, um, so I like the fact that they do that, um, for free you don't even yeah. have to subscribe i don't think of course it's ad supported i mean that's uh, sure you know yeah got to get something but um that's pretty much my media visual media consumption that's how uh, you're doing it regiment cool. cool uh speaking of ad supported i want to talk about our next two sponsors if that works for you mr braun okay all right look it's 2020 have you looked at your wireless bill lately you're probably paying too much, right? Because network coverage is better than ever, no matter your wireless provider. So why pay more for the same service? That's where Mint Mobile comes from, right? Because they can cut your bill down to just 15 bucks a month for the same premium coverage. And I know you're thinking, well, this is too good to be true, but these guys know what they're doing. We've been using Mint Mobile here at Mac Geekab for over a year. I've tested it in all kinds of different places, and it's been great. The speeds are killer. It's easy to set up. They support all the Apple features that I want, like, you know, visual voicemail and uh, everything, right? It's just like, it just works. And that's the beauty, right? Because your old wireless bill pays for all those expensive retail stores and overhead and so Mint Mobile just reimagined that and took that out of the equation and passes those savings along. That's their business model. That's how it works. Now, look, every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text plus crazy fast 4G LTE. You can use your own phone. You buy a plan that includes the amount of 4G LTE that you want to use, the amount of data that you want to use. But right now for the next six weeks or so until the middle of May, uh, you can top that up for free because of everything that's going on here. And that's pretty cool of Mint Mobile to let you do that. But in general, you're not paying for unlimited because we don't use unlimited. We use a certain amount. 
So why not just pay for that certain amount and save some money? So here you go. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile's got you covered with their seven-day money-back guarantee. So go check it out. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash MGG. That's mintmobile.com slash MGG. Cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash MGG. And our thanks to Mint Mobile for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is a tool I use all the time, especially nowadays, but I've always used it because I work at home all the time. And that's PDF Pen, because PDF Pen 11 is the ultimate tool for editing PDFs on the Mac. So, do you need to edit text in your documents? No problem. You can do that in PDF Pen, including in tables. You can store graphics in PDF Pen's library that you commonly use. Plus, it has different shapes for drawing, proofreading marks, and stamps for marking documents as like red, confidential. It supports Apple Script, so you can automate things. I know. And, of course, it supports macOS Catalina and PDF Pen for iPad and iPhone support iOS 13 and Apple Pencil. Very cool stuff. You can redact things super easily in this. I, you know, talked recently on the show about how I had to redact some Social Security numbers from a, a tax document that I needed to send in for one of my kids' college, you know, financial aid things. And uh, I thought, oh, my gosh, my Social Security number's all over this. Wait. PDF pen. I launched PDF pen. I put it in find and redact mode. Five seconds. Done. That was it. Super simple. You can sign things, of course. You can do all kinds of things with this. All the things that you need to do when you're working digitally with PDFs. So go check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash podcast. That's where you go to learn more about PDF pen. Then you can set up your downloads and all that from there. Our thanks to Smile and PDF Pen for sponsoring this episode. All right, we've got some quick tips, John. Sound good? Cool. Yes. All right, quick tips it is then. Let's go to, let's start with Paul. Um, two episodes ago, we were, or three maybe, we were talking about Quick Look, where you can hit the space bar, not just in the finder, but also in like file dialogues and things like that to see what a file is, the contents of a file, either the picture if it's an image or, you know, the actually the contents if it's a document, things like that. Um, Paul adds, he says, an extension onto Seth's second quick tip about that. He says, after pressing the space bar in the finder to quick look at a file, you can use the arrow keys to get previews of the other files in that folder without opening and closing Quick Look. It just happens in the background. And th this is like, I say this often, this is the perfect example of a quick tip because what Paul just described for us all here is something I do like probably 10 times a day, but I don't think about it and I've never thought to mention it on the show. So I'm so glad that Paul did because these are, this is what a quick tip is. Those things that we, when you know it, you just do it. It becomes part of your whole, you know, routine. And then you don't think to tell people about it. Thankfully, Paul thought to tell people about it, right? So yeah, this is one of those things. Just once you're in quick look, start moving your cursor, you know, with the arrows up and down and it will jump from file to file, and you get to see the different quick looks of all the different files. It's super great. I like it. Handy, 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 especially if you're in a folder of like images or documents where the names are similar and you can tell by peeking in. There you go. So thank you, Paul. Good stuff. I know. I shouldn't get that excited about a quick tip, but, you know, I do. It's good. Thoughts, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I think I've, I've been uh, instinctively done that as well. So, yeah, cool. right. Yeah, it's an instinctive thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it, we were talking in the last episode about VPNs and using it to tr using a VPN to troubleshoot uh, Internet issues. And in the last episode, we uh, we diagnosed correctly, although we may not have been correct. But it turns out we were. But uh, as Craig will point out, there might have been another way. We were diagnosing an issue where uh, a user was having or a listener was having uh, problems connecting. But when they added a VPN to their connection, 
all their problems went away. We surmised that it was a DNS issue and that by connecting to the VPN, bypassing all the local DNS, it solved the problem. And it's true. That's exactly what happened. However, that's not always what a VPN is telling you because as Craig pointed out, uh, let me say that, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of where the best part is to get in here. Uh, he says, if everything is unreachable, that's another issue. But when not at all, VPNs can help. And he agrees that having a VPN as a troubleshooting tool is great. Because many slash most websites are located at hosting centers and whether those are owned or leased by the larger companies or rented space by smaller mid-sized companies, they all have one common characteristic. These hosting locations typically have multiple ISP carriers and may even have redundant high speed fiber connections to any one ISP. As we all know, between our devices and the websites are our local ISP network, regional, regional and national backbone networks, and carrier exchanges. So there can be many problems along the way, not just DNS locally. And the beauty of using a VPN connection as a troubleshooting step is that it changes your network topology. Because instead of taking the path that you would normally take to that host, you go to the VPN and then you take their path in, and that can be super helpful. So that could very well have been the issue that we were solving in the last show with, or two shows ago, with the VPNs, John. But it turns out in that one case, it wasn't. It, we did diagnose a, D, a DNS issue, but we could very easily have also been diagnosing, diagnosing some kind of topology issue. And I've certainly had that, you know, where, where we host, say, Mac Observer, there have been times, thankfully not all that frequent, where there's some issue between me and the host and or the hosting, you know, the backbone getting there, like when there's been some problems on the East Coast. And I can get to some servers in California, but not servers in Virginia and that sort of thing. Using something like ExpressVPN, uh, I could have kind of routed around and gotten to, um, you know, gotten to it that way. So it's that, it's an interesting thing to think of a VPN as a uh, topology uh, troubleshooting tool. So I like it. That's good. You got to be able to get out to the internet. Without that, it, all bets are off. But once you're there, if you are having weirdness, it's a good little tool. So thank you, Craig, for, for shining the light on that. It's good. Thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? That is, of course, if the VPN profile that you have is set to go to a DNS. Uh, just a quick tip here. If you're using OpenVPN on the Synology, typically... What happens is that it creates a couple of configuration files, and if you want to put them on another thing, like your iPhone, you drag those files over um, to the iPhone. Uh, here's the problem is that I, what I found is that they don't set the DNS, because when I tried to, to run uh, one of my configurations recently, it didn't connect to anything. And then when I looked at the logs, it was like, I can't resolve, or it's like, yeah. I, I don't have a DNS setting. I'm like, oh, okay, so. You know, had to uncomment that in the text file and say, you know, DNS one 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 or whatever. Sure, sure. And then yeah. it worked. Yeah. So, um, huh. I think that's only specific to OpenVPN on Synology. So. Yeah, OpenVPN's a little weird, but that's just how it goes. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go. One more tip from Mark. Uh, in episode 806, he says uh, we were talking about using cell providers and things like that. And we were talking in 806, I believe that's where we were talking about using um, a an, uh, cell connection as your backup internet connection. And he says three out of four times when you discuss those, uh, I'm yelling colorful metaphors because the answer to the questions are usually T-Mobile. He says because T-Mobile announced an ISP a while back. Uh, and uh, it, it comes with a little, as he calls it, a gizmo that uh, that allows you to connect, you know, a, a, a mobile Internet connection to your um, to your to your main thing, you know, and, uh, and and it becomes your your like it replaces your cable modem or your or your DSL or whatever it is. Um they have no data caps, no price hikes. So uh, pretty cool. And uh, 
I had no idea that T-Mobile had an ISP, which is interesting because with 5G coming around, that might well be, they might be kind of paving the way for that. So that's pretty good. It's pretty good. So anyway, he says he has, he's been using it and his service is about 50 down or 10 up, which is way better than what he was getting with his rural ISP out there, uh, his wired ISP. So wireless ISP. So that's pretty good. T-Mobile ISP. I like it. Who knew? I guess, uh, I guess Mark knew, huh? Did you, had you heard about this, John? Uh, no, I had not. Okay. Um, well, there we go. But there is something that I heard of because Verizon messaged, messaged me okay. the other day. And, you know, with all, all the stuff going on here, um, people using relatively more data because they're home all day or work from home and all that. Um, Verizon sent me a message saying, we have added 15 gigs of data to your plan at no charge to use from 325 through 430. So check your messages or sign up for text messages from Verizon and yeah. uh, you can find out that you got Tons of data. Now. So, that, but that's not that's not an ISP. That's just on like a, a cell phone. No, or that's something. the hotspot. Okay. Yeah. 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 Got the... it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I found a couple of interesting things this week. Speaking of network topology, we went to watch a YouTube video on our Apple TV, and I got this message that I have seen before that said uh, something along the lines of content restricted. You need to log in with a G Suite account. And I'm like, what? Like, I watched this on my phone, logged into the same account. No, no. Like, the, what's going on here? So I did a little bit of searching. And immediately, people were talking about how this problem was happening if they were using a, um, like, some kind of parental controls or content filter. And I thought, ooh, wait a minute. You know, I currently have my Synology router set up, and I have different profiles for each member of the house. And then I have like an IOT profile that's a lot more locked down than the individual profiles for people. Cause I can assign like my iPhone and my Macs and like kids Macs and all of that stuff. Uh, but the IOT stuff, I just kind of leave in a, you know, far more restricted uh, profile to block them from, you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing. Cause if one of them gets hacked, then, you know, I wouldn't necessarily know. Well, my Apple TV w was sitting in that IoT profile. I moved it to my profile temporarily, and boom, the problem went away. So if you've seen that content restricted to G Suite account, you know, uh, issue, the solution is fix your parental controls uh, because that, or your content restrictions, because that may well be the issue. So, uh, so there you go. Uh, interesting i don't know have you ever run into that john no no i don't watch uh i mostly watch youtube on my uh well i watch some youtube stuff no i've, I've yeah. never gotten any sort of uh interesting yeah okay, i've so gotten warning sometimes that uh <laughs> oh i remember i got this the other day you, it, someone had sent us a, a youtube video by the time i got to it it said it had been removed uh, due to violation from so and so, and I'm like, who's so and so? Uh, so and so, so and so is. Remember that that song that we got? What song? Gary. Gary sent us a, a, okay. a funny video. Okay. Yeah. When I went to the the link for that video, it said it had been pulled by, and then the name of somebody. I didn't realize that that was one of the members of the band who's. Uh, ah, right. The parody was being done, and I guess they they didn't like it so i think it was a parody of a queen song right and so yeah yes. somebody somebody in queen has is is the one that's assigned the rights on that so they would get notification and then they can either choose to leave it up or have it yanked and they probably have an automated thing that yeah, just but yanks isn't it parody kind of allowed i, I guess not uh, it depends I, yeah i i mean it, with the whole dmca thing con it's a guilty until proven innocent scenario so mm. Uh, YouTube will pull things down right away, as most ISPs would, and then and then you know if you want to uh, you know file an appeal or whatever, you can you can perhaps mm. and maybe that one would have made it, maybe it wouldn't have, I don't know, but at the moment uh, that you checked, it did not. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing is, I searched on the name of the person and added the word like parody video and. A whole bunch of other sources came up, so it it has spread. Sure. So yeah, I, that makes I, sense. I doubt he'll, the genie's out of the bottle in this case. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. 
I another thing that I found this week. So I've been having a problem for I'll say months. It might have gone on longer than that. Every now and then, my iCloud photos will stop syncing down to my Mac. I have one. The one Mac in my office is the one that's set to be, you know, download all originals so that I have a copy of all my originals here. And then, of course, I can clone that to whatever I want. Uh, and I'll notice that it'll be like months that it hasn't downloaded something because I don't mess around like on that machine all that often with photos. And so I dug, John. I, I used Activity Monitor's um, file, open files and ports thing. I looked at at it said it was you know still downloading from iCloud so I filtered activity monitor by photo to get down to things that were there and I just started looking and cloud photos d is the process that for me was holding this up and it might be an issue for some of you if you have the same type of files that I did so I looked and it was hung up on a a file that ended in .3gp I forget what 3GP stands for. Maybe John will be looking it up while I'm telling you this. But um, 3GP files are video files from, like, old cell phones in, in the olden days. And evidently, I have some of these in my photos library. Now, these had all pulled down from iCloud because the only way that I ever... Um, I, it, the only way I've solved this problem in the past is to just wipe out my photos library and let it slurp it down uh, from iCloud fresh. So... They can exist on iCloud, and I can go find them and, and watch them on iCloud. But uh, it did not. Uh, it, it, would, it seems to clog up the, uh, the Cloud Photos D thing f at some point in time, and I don't know what that point is, but it does. So I created a smart album, and the smart album says, you know, file name ends in .3gp, and it found these five photos or five videos I exported them to my drive. Now, I exported them as raw videos uh, so that they were still in 3GP format. I think I could have exported them as movies and converted them and solved this problem in that, you know, re-importing them back in. I then had to go, I deleted them from my photos library. Uh, I also went to iCloud, because uh, you can see photos on the web now, and I deleted them from there so that I was sure to get them out of both locations. Now, at this point, I had to restart the Cloud Photos D process. You can do that by rebooting your Mac, or you can do it by force quitting it in Activity Monitor, and then it'll just relaunch. And at that point, Cloud Photos started crunching along and doing more work, and finally it made it through, and now things are sinking. And I think my problem that has been a recurring problem for a long time is solved. So if you've got 3GP videos in your library, or if you've run into this problem before where cloud photo or it, your iCloud photo syncing has, you know, gotten gummed up, this might be the issue. Uh, so take a look for those, uh, those 3GP photos or videos. Um, I don't know. It's crazy. Right? Crazy, John. Uh, not really. What's 3GP? Did you look it up? Uh, third generation partnership project. Okay. Sure. And I found a little article... Uh, which may help here, um, they suggest one thing that may work is changing the extension to M4P in that it may have confused whatever codec they have that's trying to uh, process the video. But um, Oh, so, so uh, not converting. MP4, I'm sorry. But not converting, but just changing it to MP4 and, and letting it, see it that way might help. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Right. No, the line here, it says, uh, yeah, since they use the same codec, you, have, you may have luck renaming a 3GP or 3G2 to MP4. So, anyways, I'll, I'll post this huh. article. Go figure. Cool. Cool. Yeah, all right. Thanks. That's great. Huh. Huh. All right. Uh, okay. Moving on to a last sort of PSA slash tip from listener Thomas. Uh, Thomas was in a scenario where he felt the need to call 911. Thankfully, everything was okay. He said uh, he was in his car, and this part's relevant to the PSA. And uh, he was trying to call 911 and waiting for, you know, the tone or nothing. And, and he dialed 911. He's driving. 
And finally, he looks down at his phone, and it's waiting for him to pick which Bluetooth speaker to connect with before the call will be made to 911. So just be aware of that, that the iPhone will, if it, if it normally asks you which Bluetooth device to choose when you're in your car, uh, that will also happen with 911. So thank you for the heads up, Thomas. I'm obviously glad that you're safe and it wasn't an, uh, the emergency that it may have been. So that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, yeah, I've been bitten by that too. Okay. In a different way. So I have a Bluetooth uh, streaming doohickey in my car. And if I get too close to the part of the house that's close to the car, sometimes my phone will switch over to that. I think it goes oh, to sleep eventually, but um, yeah, because uh, one time, yeah, I made a call and, you know, I was like, hello, hello, and, you know, can you hear me? And, you know, the, I was connected, but we, we weren't communicating, and then I looked at the audio selection, and it was like, yeah, I'm, t uh, I'm connected to the car. Is that okay? And I'm like, no. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I want to take a minute and thank a bunch of, but not probably not quite all, of the Folks whose premium contributions have come in for Mac Geekab in the last um, uh, couple of weeks here. And so on our, and all of this is available, of course, at MacGeekab.com slash premium. Uh, and you do get access to that premium at MacGeekab.com email address, plus the warm, fuzzy feeling that, uh, that you get from supporting your two favorite geeks. Uh, on the biannual plan, at 25 bucks every six months, I'd like to thank Patrick from Shreveport, Bruce W., Matt from Midlothian, Eric from Trondheim, Doug S., Jeff S., Daniel from London, Mary from Monterey at 100 bucks, Ben from Sustainable Computing in Berkeley for 36 Corey from Kenmore, Michael from Naperville, Richard from Pontrug at 30 bucks, Jason from St. Louis, Michael from Troy, Norton from Bethesda, Ed Ware from Crum. I might have that name wrong, so if you are Edward, my apologies, sir. Uh, Gerard from Meridian, JP from Studio City at 50 bucks, Joel F., Craig S., Dan E., John O., Tony G., Michael P., Paul from Tunbridge Wells, Gary from Chicago, Richard from Quakerton, Ron G., John from Vevey at $60, Greg from Los Angeles, Robert from Oro Valley, Brian from Johnson City, Anthony from Ride, Joe B., Eric from Albuquerque, and Drake from Honolulu. And then on the monthly $10 plan, I'd like to thank Robert from Clearwater, Stephen from Costa Mesa, Everett from Marina, Olga from Bellevue, Gary from Babylon, Jason from Charlestown, Luann from Albuquerque, Ward from Mesa, Paul from Fishers, and Mark from Milford. And lastly, some one-time contributions that have come in. Joseph from Marietta, Jordan from Santa Barbara, uh, Joseph from Marietta at $50, Jordan at $25, Jay from Caledonia also at $50, Eric from Brampton also at $25, and Mac Monkey Boy from Toronto at $50. So thank you so much to all of you. Uh, as you know, the, the whole thing works because it all works, and you are a huge part of that. Our sponsors are a big part of that. And frankly, everybody that contributes questions and tips and cool stuff found, that's a part of this too because – that's actually the biggest part is that. So it all works together, and we really, we're super appreciative. Uh, I know I say that all the time, but especially right now, we're super appreciative that we get to do this, and we still get to do this, and we basically get to do it in the way that we always have, which is awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, John, we've got some Catalina stuff. Shall we dive in here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Douglas, Douglas is not the only one. Several people this week asked a very similar question that, uh, Douglas, so he's acting as a proxy for all of you. He says, recently you've mentioned a number of times that Catalina is designed mainly for SSDs. I have a 2017, 27 inch iMac with a one terabyte fusion drive, and I want to upgrade to Catalina. Would this be a problem? And do you recommend not doing it and staying with Mojave? I also have a four terabyte external spindle drive that I have partitioned and cloned each of my Macs as bootable backups using carbon copy cloner. I only boot from these clones in a pinch. Is it possible to create a bootable clone of Catalina uh, on this type of external drive? And finally, if I were to use an external SSD as my main boot drive for Catalina, how would this compare to using Catalina installed on my internal Fusion drive? 
Uh, okay, so yeah, that's interesting. I I think a lot of folks are taking this, um, you know, at home time and downtime as the opportunity to, to do that uh, Catalina migration that maybe they've been holding off on for uh, for a little while because they've been busy or whatever. So because it like so much of this stuff has come in. Um, the main difference that we've seen between Mojave and Catalina on Fusion Drives is iCloud Drive. If you are syncing documents and desktop, that on a Fusion Drive or a Spindle Drive seems to cause a ton of extra disk access and really will slow down the finder. So if you're not syncing documents and desktop, you're, our experience is you're going to be fine with Catalina on a Fusion Drive. But if you are, then you either want to stop syncing documents and desktop or uh, move to an SSD or something like that. Uh, any thoughts on that part of this, John, before we um, before we kind of plow through the rest of it? No, I'm, I'm with you so far. OK, cool. Um, so the 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 second part of this question. Well, let's talk about the SSD. Uh Booting from an SST, that iMac has two Thunderbolt 3 ports. So you can use any of the external Thunderbolt 3 SSDs that we've been mentioning recently or, it, you know, any of the other ones that we haven't yet mentioned. Um, they all support data transfers in that 2,000 and, and greater megabyte per second range. So you're going to get lots of throughput out of those. Um, of course, you get the low, very, very low latency of an SSD. And all of that should work just fine. So I would, I, I would, I would lean towards doing that. If not right out of the gate, certainly think about that down the road because that 2017 iMac still has, well, I would say, a lot of life in it. So you know, and it, and it's not a portable machine in that booting from an external drive. That's eh, not that big of a deal. So, um, so I think you're okay on that. Any thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Before we move on. No, I am. Uh... Yeah, last I checked, I am all SSD for both my internal drives and my uh, clone drives. Oh, nice. And I think I told you the other day I had to re restore a very large file. So at first I was like, um, I was like, I'll restore it from my CCC clone. And I was getting, it's a SanDisk, I think a SanDisk SSD. Okay. And, and it's in a uh, USB 3 point something enclosure, but I was getting 500 megabytes a second throughput. Oh, that's awesome. Because at first I was pulling the file down from my NAS, and I and the th and it was like you know this is going to take an hour, and I'm like oh come on man yeah and the speed wasn't that great uh, that's something I, th I still have to figure out but I'm like no let me pull it off the clone and it was like yeah I'm going to be done in five minutes it's like wow that's great <laughs> that's great that's awesome okay it's good I, on your NAS though um, check the the next time you try to copy that file or if you have time and you just want to mess with it. Um, launch resource monitor on the Synology and look at CPU usage and disk usage to see w which one of those things is your bottleneck there. Because it could well, be was, the CPU. Well, this was the Drobo. And maybe uh, that's the problem. That <laughs> it's could Drobo be the problem. FS, which was oh, not one that's of the CPU. performing. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the CPU slowing you down. It, okay. yeah, it seems strange that file sharing would be a CPU hog, but in, in this case, it can be, so... Yeah, okay. that's your issue. Yeah, I'll, I'll 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 put them on the Synology, and uh, yeah, let me do that. I'll, I'll do that as an exercise and see what kind of throughput I got in the Synology. Because yeah, 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 mine are pretty recent. Uh, yeah, fairly recent, so they have some decent multi-core CPUs. Right, right. At least one of them does. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, what was the next question here? Oh, booting from the four terabyte external spindle drive. Can you boot Catalina that way? Well. Catalina can only boot from APFS drives. So it will, uh, when you do a clone with Carbon Copy Cloner, it will attempt to, but also force you to convert at least that. It's going to try and convert just that partition, but um, things can get wonky with this. To, but it's got to be APFS, otherwise Catalina will not boot because it's doing the whole split volume thing and, and all of that. So... Uh, that part might or might not be an issue for you, depending on how you have that drive laid out. But be ready for that to potentially be an issue. And you might need to sort of carve out a separate drive or get a separate drive to use as your clone for your Catalina volumes until you've got everything on Catalina. And then and then obviously you can sort of get there with it. So just be aware of that. You might you might run into it. The, the, the final question 
that Douglas asked that I did not include in the first round is when listening, he said to episode 796 with Mike Bombick, uh, who makes Carbon Copy Cloner, uh, he says, you mentioned exercising your external drives, especially your spindle drives, that aren't used all that often to avoid bit rot or something like it. My question is, what would be a good way of doing this, considering that these drives are not constantly connected to my computer? Um, you know, the so my Synology and your Synology has a feature called data scrubbing, and I highly recommend you turn it on. I realize I'm taking this in a different direction, uh, but I'll come back. Uh, now you can actually have it schedule data scrubbing and you can do it every three months or six months or however often you want. I do mine on my main Synology every three months uh, just because I want to find out if there's, you know, bit rot happening and I want to, I want to catch it early, but it does scour through everything on the drive and it takes a while and it slows things down. In fact, we had to, I had to tell my Synology to ease off a little bit last night when we wanted to watch a movie because the file was on there and it was slowing down our ability to read the movie file. So, uh, but once you can do that, I mean, it, it, by default, it's actually fine. I had it set to be really aggressive and get it done fast. And I, I overdid it, uh, evidently. So that is that, this, that data scrubbing is for exactly this reason. Now there is no sort of built in functionality on the Mac to do this. Um, you could do, I don't know, like that. I don't, I don't know how I would do this, John, um, cloning uh, just, the go ahead or i would say make a weekly or monthly task on your task list but what would the task would weekly visit. no i'd do it quarterly maybe but what would you do That's quarterly great. like what i mean when you mount it like in order to have it read everything on the drive what do you like how would you do that uh, i don't know if i'd read the entire drive i don't know you know plug it in maybe do a benchmark on it or something. Mm. I don't know if you have to, uh, I just think you want to have something happening um, on the drive. Eh. I guess that's better than nothing. Uh, yeah. I got I to gotta think about that. Cause yeah, I mean the, the data scrubbing on the Synology, I mean, that's, I mean, I think it's basically checking the integrity of the, the checksums and all that. And if it's, if it doesn't match, it rebuilds it. Um, right. We really don't have, hmm. Yeah, I think the point is you just want to have something happening with the drive okay. uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, a year is probably too long. Monthly, maybe maybe monthly is about right. Yeah, yeah. If you well, I know how I am. If I scheduled it for monthly, it would get done quarterly because it's just one of those things. Where you're like, well, I'm not going to do it today, but I'll do it. You know, I know it needs to be done. It'll be done soon. So you know, it's it's one of those things. Yeah, yeah. Because I actually had an SSD that I had in my pile of drives that I had an exercise and. Um, well, it's in the recycle bin now because it would not even mount at all. Oh. Maybe it's because I didn't exercise it. It was it was one of one of the older ones that I've had for a few years. But yeah, I'm like, what's is, is the enclosure broken? No, the drive was just gone. No, yeah. Nothing detected it, so that made yeah. me sad. That is sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how it goes. Yeah, as Kiwi Graham in uh, in one of our chat rooms at live.macgeekab.com says, make sure the spindle starts turning. That's the main key. So thank you, Kiwi Graham. Good stuff. Uh, all right. Chris has an interesting thing. It, this problem may be solved, but I wanted to throw it out. Chris is a, a consultant, goes around and helps lots of folks and small businesses and some large businesses with their computing. I know we have a lot of you uh, that do that. That, that listen to this show. So I wanted to share Chris's uh, scenario here. He says, I've had several incidents of Catalina data migration, not, and that is migration assistant, not bringing over 100% of user data. Thanks to backups, I was able to rectify these situations without trouble. One recent, uh, on a recent episode of Command Control Power podcast, they also talked about this happening to them. So to solve this or protect against it uh my migration path is uh first with all new computers coming in the door i now do a drive wipe and os install or os imaging uh, i've seen enough quirky software behavior with brand new macs out of the box in the last year that i have adopted a policy of wiping all systems that i am tasked with setting up well, at least that way you know what you're starting with that's fair uh, in my os images he says 
uh, I've seen a single, and you know what? I agree with that, Chris, because I was just setting up that MacBook Air that uh, was the loaner from Apple, and it was wonky trying to do migration out of the gate. I wound up wiping it, and then everything was fine. So that's interesting. Uh, he says, uh, in my OS images, I have a single user account set up that's called Mac user, and I always use the same password for it. Uh, if I do an OS install instead, I still set up this user account uh, one of the reasons being is that it, doing a mic, it's been shown that doing a migration right after the, the initial OS install, so as part of the install, is not as reliable as doing the install, setting up a user account, and then starting migration. Fair, okay? Uh, and he says, at the same time I'm prepping a new machine, I have a clone backup of the old Mac in progress with the source Mac booted to one of my consulting drives. Even if the source Mac has a backup already, I'm taking the precaution of making my own make sense. Uh, he says, then I run disk repair, then I run migration assistant. After the migration, I reboot the new system before logging into any user accounts. I boot this new system to my consulting drive, I run carbon copy cloner, and I set the clone source as the user's home folder on the old computer. So this is after migration assistant, running carbon copy cloner, this is the key to this, setting the clone source as the user's home folder on the old computer and the destination as their home folder on the new computer. Very interesting. He also checks to see if they have more than one user folder or any data in the shared folder. If he does, then he does the whole user's folder, not just the individual user folder. But this is interesting. So do migration assistant and then clone from the old drive to the new one to catch anything that has not made it through Migration Assistant. Um, he said, then he boots it up normally and sets the permissions and kind of moves forward from there. But this is a, this is interesting. So I'm curious. He says that this may have been solved in a recent update to Mac OS, which includes an update to Migration Assistant. So it may be catching those things that it wasn't catching before. But that's not a bad idea to do that carbon copy cloner uh, clone of just the user folder just to make sure that you've got everything. I kind of like that as a safety net. I don't know. What do you think, man? Um, I've been okay with uh, Migration Assistant. Okay. You haven't found anything. Yeah, and, and I think for the most part, the yeah, when you're... I think you select the Documents folder, and that's basically... It's, yeah, doing the home folder. So yeah. having another backup of that, yeah, that makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, I kind of like it. I mean, especially if he's, you know, I mean, it's one thing for us doing it with our own machines, but but he's tasked with making sure that that data gets over there. That's, you know, doing that second pass, that's smart. I asked him what he was finding in there, and he said it was, you know, some sometimes documents, files, sometimes preferences, but like I said, he thinks... He hasn't, it's gotten better as of late. So perhaps mm -hmm. uh, whatever migration assistant was missing is no longer missing. So cool. You want to, uh, you want to tell us? Peter. Yes. All right. Peter has a good one and you have something to add here, Dave. But mm. uh, uh, I did a deep dive, if you will, on this. Um, my MacBook Pro updated to Mac OS 10.15.4 last night and I was greeted this morning by a flurry of dialogues informing me that several extensions would no longer work in a future version. And he links to an Apple support article that goes into a bit of detail about this, but not enough, I would say. Um, my problem is that for, the most, for most of them, the developer name didn't help me identify specifically which extensions are affected. Do you have any suggestions as how to identify the extension so I can start future-proofing my system? Okay, so the first thing to do, and I did this when I got this, is I made a screenshot of each of the dialogues. Um, and I got three of them when I applied the update. And it said, existing software on your system loaded a system extension signed by, and then that's the company. And I had three, Malwarebytes Corporation, Objective Development Software GmbH, and Logitech. Okay. Um, Here's the tool that you're going to want to use with a strategic sorting to find this out. So uh, run system information, uh, Apple menu and hold down option, and check out the software extensions section. Um, and there's going to be a number of columns there. Um, from is who makes it, and there's basically two values. Well, maybe three. Um, Apple, which doesn't it doesn't concern uh, Apple extensions, but then you're going to see uh, identified developer, I believe, is the... Uh, classification those are the ones that you're going to um you're going to want to look at because that's where these are going to be or at least all of them were in my case um 
the other thing you'll notice is that the Apple ones are in system library extensions. Um, the other thing, but, but then once you resort the list here, looking through it, now fortunately all the ones that I had were pretty easy. So uh, one I found was MB underscore MBAM underscore protection, Malwarebytes, MB. Okay, that's cool. Um, now if you highlight that, you're going to see a number of uh, entries for that extension. Here's what you want to look at. Signed by. So everybody has to sign their extensions. And signed by is going to tell you the name of the company, but in addition, you're also going to see the path of the extension. So like in the case of this one, it was in library, application support, malwarebytes, mbam, kx, mb, uh, dot kext. Um, now that's weird because I didn't know you could even put an extension, a uh, kernel extension in application support, but that's where that one is. Um, and then I did similar with um, objective development. If you don't know, objective development is the maker of Little Snitch. And that one was, uh, and it was listed as Little Snitch. Okay, that's cool. And of course, the signer is objective development. Sure. Uh, that's also, that's in library, slash library, slash extensions, if you want a place to look for potential violators. And then the last one was Logitech. And also, they, they named it right. So there, it was Logitech HID devices uh, and Logitech Unifying. And those were in library extensions, uh, library extensions as well. Okay. So I think that rounds it out. Now you, I think you have some input, Dave, here because you, you talked about this on a TDO a while back, and there, uh, you could probably guess the the so the class of things that may get legacied are things that l look at the file stream, which is what Malwarebytes does, or right. look at the network stream, which is what Little Snitch does. And I'm not sure which one of the Logitech ones why they identified. Ah. Them. I suppose they inter inter interrupt the data stream as well. So, well, or, or no, Apple has a, one. yeah, It not all kernel extensions are deprecated yet, but they probably all will be eventually. But right now, so in Catalina, it, it deprecated means they will still work. You shouldn't build anything new with them. And they will likely not work in the future. And then, of course, the messages that we saw with 10.15.4 are indicating that 10.16 is where these will not work, right? And Apple's article about this talks about a few different types, the few different types of kernel extensions that are affected. Anything touching the network filter, um, they can, and there, and there are new things that these developers can use called system extensions. So we're going from kexts to sexts. Yep, that's right. <laughs> We're all developers are sexting now. So uh, <laughs> network filter is is one of the ones that is being closed off. Everything in the uh, IO USB family or IO HID, the human interface family. So all of those devices that are keyboards, mice, all of that stuff that require extra drivers. No, you can't do that with a system wide kernel extension anymore. Again, there's other things, USB driver kit or HID driver kit that are less low level, but still get the job done. They just need to rewrite it. But it also includes USB networking and those sorts of things too. Uh, so it's basically USB stuff and network stuff that is uh, being impacted by this change. To be very specific, one thing that's not being impacted by this change are drive-related, storage-related kernel extensions. Those are still allowed um, at the moment and presumably with 10.16. They have not been deprecated at all, nor is there any flag that, um, that anybody should change yet. But <clears throat> it wouldn't surprise me if eventually we are. We do get there. But, but yeah, these are, these are sort of the common ones that that can and should be there are there is a different path for these to be taken and developers need to take that path and now based on what you just told us john we get to know which developers take that path so yeah yeah it's good um one other thing i'll throw out since we're we're merging the combine the, the discussion of these kernel extensions as well as in with the discussion of migration assistant and catalina I'll refer us back to Mac Geek Cab 778 when I first did a migration assistant with Catalina and realized that I did not get the ability to approve all those kernel extensions. And I ran into it again 
uh, when I was migrating to this MacBook Air, right? It like it migrates them over, but it doesn't turn them on because I haven't given that machine permission to run them. And it doesn't ask me for permission to run them because they're already flagged as having been asked from the old machine. So there's a disconnect there. You got to run two terminal commands. At least I think you need to run two. You might only need to run the second one, but I run both and we'll put them in the show notes. It's a uh, you kext cla- cache clear staging and then kext cache dash I and you point it at the drive that wipes out and you, you don't have to re- try and remember them here. They're just they're in the show notes at MacGeekab.com. Copy and paste them into the terminal. You're good to go. Uh, when you run that second one, it will start popping up those dialogues that you see when you first install these kernel extensions. It wipes out any memory of having asked you about them. And then you can go to system preferences, security and privacy general and approve them or deny them if you choose. But the point would be to approve them and uh, and actually get them running again. So that like things like we love Intel Power Gadget. That won't work if you copy it, if you migrate it over until you do this and then it works just fine. Yeah, there you go. I found that. Thank you. You're you're welcome. Yeah, no, it's a handy thing. I keep this in my in my little uh, bag of tricks. You know, I have like a little Evernote folder of uh, tech tips, and this is one that I keep there because ever since I found it, and we talked about it in 778 back in September, um, you know, that it's been like I have to run it every time because otherwise it doesn't work. So yeah, Hmm. it's crazy. Crazy, crazy. All right. And then uh, I think we got time to wrap up this segment uh, with a little PSA from Irving. I don't know how many people this will affect, but it's worth mentioning. He says, I just started updating my three Mac OS systems to Catalina 10.15.4, which is what came out recently. My major system is an iMac with six external LACI disk drives. These drives are all attached through a Firewire 800 daisy chain. During the somewhat lengthy installation all of these LACI drives were being frequently accessed by the installation software. Two of the drives were mounted and four were unmounted when the software update started. When the installation finished, several of the drives were no longer mountable and all required running disk repair to get them to mount. So my recommendation is that all external disk drives should be disc- disconnected when installing 10.15.4. I will admit that 10.15.4 is now installed and working perfectly, but it did did cause this uh, considerable frustration, and I wish I had known to unplug the FireWire connection to my external disk drives before starting the update. It's not a bad idea uh, if you've got external drives connected to to punt them when you're doing a system update. That way you know you're updating the right drive. It's not going to go scouring. It'll probably go faster if, uh, if the installer is doing something to these drives, so... Not a bad, not a bad thing. Yeah. So thank you for that, Irving. Good stuff. Yeah. Anything else, Mr. Braun? Yeah, I got to remember to do that. I've been doing some installations and fiddling with the, the new Mac Mini here. Yeah. But um, I have uh, my clone drive. And of course, when you reboot the system, it's going to mount the clone drive. Um, sure. I had a, more than one situation where I tried to launch an app from uh, Spotlight. Yeah. And it chose the version that was on <laughs> that drive. The, the external drive instead of the internal. So uh, eject unnecessary drives is a, is a good suggestion. Yeah. Well, not just eject because his were ejected. Like you need to disconnect, like power down oh. or, or like, yeah, air gap okay. them. Yeah, it was his advice. But you bring up a good thing. Like Carbon Copy Cloner and Super Duper are smart because you can tell them to eject your clone after it finishes doing the clone. But when you mm-hmm. boot your Mac, until it does that first clone it doesn't know to eject that drive. So I wrote a little automator um, uh, thing that uh, that ejects the disk, and I just put it in my in my startup so that it'll eject, it'll mount the drive because it's always going to mount it. It's a pain in the neck to try and get it to not mount it. Uh, but I just let it mount it, and then it runs this little automator action that, um, or automator application, I should say, that, that you know, ejects the drive and mm-hmm. and then and then you know my clone app can mount it no problem and it mounts it and does it and ejects it and then it's not getting messed with the spotlight or any of those things so there you go if you want a screenshot for that ask me i can send it to your i'll i can i post it in our forums actually at macgeekup.com slash forums so mm-hmm. yeah all right well that's what we got i think we uh i think we we made it through um i got the music everything's good it's all we made it john 
<sighs> All right. Well, thank you for listening. If you have your stuff to send in, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is where we would uh, we would like you to send it. I didn't see that right. Did you? Oh, here you're right. Did you say feedback at MacGeekGab.com? I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Unless you're a premium listener, like we mentioned, and then premium at MacGeekGab.com is for you. Uh, those reviews, we would love those five-star reviews. Let's just keep on rolling with that. So MacGeekGab.com slash reviews is the closest we can get you. So there you go. Go check that out and sign up for our newsletter while you're there because that's, you know, it helps. It, it Well, it helps you. It allows us to get the show notes to you. And that's that's good. Uh, thanks to everybody who listened. Thanks to everybody for all your help uh, with all our video setup and all that crazy stuff. Uh, it's a team effort, as you all know, and we really appreciate it. It's iterating every single week, and it's good. Thanks to Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to all of our sponsors, of course, the ones we mentioned in this episode, um, mintmobile.com slash MGG, mailroot.net slash MGG, and of course, smilesoftware.com slash podcast. You all rock. Uh, our sponsors in the podcast marketplace, like Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com, barebones software at barebones.com, Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. Linode at Linode.com slash MGG. It's all good, right, John? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we made it all the way through. Almost all the way through. John, any uh, three words you might have to share with all these folks? You know, I'm I'm going to modify it a bit in these trying times here. And I'm going to say, Dave, that the three words are don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good way to avoid getting caught, my friend. I like it. <laughs> Made up.